I will be discussing the general coding guidelines. So stay tuned guys, keep watching. If you're new to my channel, don't forget to hit the subscribe button. Hit the notification bell that, so that you will be notified every time I have my new upload. So if you haven't watched the first and second video, kindly please watch those videos first before moving on to this video that I will be discussing in today's um, topics. Okay, so let's start with your general coding guidelines in your ICD-10 CM2020. So the first one, general coding guidelines, number one, locating a code in the ICD-10 CM book. So the first thing that I will discuss is you, how will you locate a code in your ICD-10 CM book. I know I discussed this in the previous videos that I have, but I'll just highlight this again in this for today's discussion to select a code in the classification that corresponds to a diagnosis or reason for visit documented in the medical record first is you need to locate the term in the alphabetic index what do you mean by the alphabetic index i discussed that in the first video that i have what what is the term that you will going to locate the term is usually the condition. I usually call this as the main term because those main terms is those terms will lead you to the correct ICD-10 CM code. So like for example, you say aspiration pneumonia. That's the diagnosis. So what should be your main term there? So the condition is pneumonia. So you need to go through in the alphabetic index with the word pneumonia. It starts with letter P. Okay. And then when you go to your pneumonia, you can, you, you can see there like you can move down and see the indention if you can see aspiration there so if you can see a word pneumonia and there's a subterm aspiration and there's a code right beside that term that should be the code that you will going to verify in the tabular list when you say tabular list if there's a code like it uh, starts with letter j go ahead and go to your alphabetic in the, to your tabular list letter j and go to that code guys you always need to read and be guided by the instructional notations that appear in both the alphabetic index and the tabular list the main reason for this one is it is essential to use both alphabetic and tabular list when locating and assigning code so the reason why you always need to verify in your tabular list because the alphabetic index does not always provide the full code so you that the alphabetic index will just give you a couple of three characters four characters there and that's not the full code yet sometimes it's the full code already but sometimes most of the time it's not yet the full code so you always need to verify it in your tabular list because when you go to your tabular list you can find there like some sub additional subdivision you can find there seven characters or you can also see like selection for laterality and you can only see that when you go through your tabular list because those laterality the seventh character is only available in the tabular list okay so that's why it's very important for you guys to always verify in the tabular list it's not optional it's a mandatory that you always need to verify in your tabular list a dash at the end of an alphabetic index and three indicates that additional characters are required so if you can see like actually the common you can see the dash in the alpha in the tabular what do you mean in the table of neoplasm <clears throat> and in the table of drugs okay um, for the alphabetic index, sometimes you can see a check sign, meaning you still need to have an additional characters or an additional characters is still required. Even if a dash is not included in the alphabetic index entry, just a reminder, it is necessary to refer to the tabular list to verify that no seventh character is required because you, you never know that uh, that certain three characters or four characters may have a seven characters unless you can unless you verify the tabular list okay so um 
it's not that I am only saying that you always need to verify the tabular list, but it's also always indicated in your ICD-10 CM guidelines. Next is the level of detail encoding. Remember, I keep mentioning when I discuss the tabular list, the second video that I have is you always need to go to the highest level of specificity or to their highest number of characters. So the reminder there is if we have four characters available, do not report the three characters only. If there's a five or six or seven character, you cannot report those characters lesser than those. Like if it's seven, you cannot report the six. If it's six, you cannot report only the five. If it's five, you cannot only report the four characters. Okay? But sometimes code with three characters are included in the ICT-10CM as the heading of the category of codes. Well, keep, remember when I discussed the tabular list, it's like when I say ca category, it's always the three character code. So it may be further subdivided by the use of fourth and fifth characters and the sixth characters, which provide a greater detail. So a three character is to be used only if there's no further subdivided. So again, a three character category code can be a valid code as long as there's no more further subdivision but if there's still a further subdivision of that code you always need to code it to the highest subdivision or to the highest number of characters available in the icd 10 cm code book a code is invalid if it's not been coded to the full number obviously that's the bottom line of the first statement at the first line that code to their highest number of characters including if there is a seven characters again the seven characters are always available in the right below your character three character codes or to your category codes you can see their a v or s again i mentioned this in my second video so codes from A00 to T89 to Z99.8. So obviously, just to keep you a quick overview, all codes from A to Z are used for to identify diagnosis, symptoms, conditions, problems, complaints, or other reason for the encounter or visit. So please keep in mind that when we are coding ICD-10 CM codes, we are just coding the reason for visit or the reason for encounter. We are not yet coding for any services or any, any procedures done by the physician or done by the provider. Okay, so keep in mind that when you are using ICD-10 CM code, you are just coding the diagnosis, the final diagnosis, the symptoms if there's no final diagnosis yet, or if there's a symptoms that is not associated to a definitive diagnosis, <clears throat> conditions, problems, complaints, or other reasons for encounter or visits. So signs and symptoms. Signs and symptoms. Is it okay to code for signs and symptoms or are we allowed to code signs and symptoms? Okay, so in general, this is the guideline. Codes that describe signs or symptoms and signs as opposed to diagnosis, meaning it's not related, are acceptable for reporting purposes when related di definitive diagnosis has not been established or confirmed by the provider yet. So you are, you are allowed to code signs and symptoms as long as there's no established or confirmed diagnosis yet. Because remember, the provider may uh, need to have the lab result first, the provider may need to have the x-ray result first before confirming any diagnosis. So it takes time for the provider to diagnose because like for example, if there's a chest pain, I cannot say that's just immediately that it is um, a heart attack. So there are many conditions or many considerations before you, they will arrive to a final diagnosis. So while waiting for that final diagnosis, you are allowed to code signs and symptoms as long as there's no established or confirmed or definitive diagnosis yet by the provider. So sometimes the common code that you may use is in the chapter 18, the signs, symptoms, and normal clinical and laboratory findings R00 to R99 so these codes we will be discussing that when we will already on the chapter 18 okay so here 
you are allowed to code signs and symptoms if there's no definitive diagnosis yet. What if there's already there's already an available di- definitive diagnosis? Are you still allowed to code signs and symptoms if there's already a definitive or a confirmed diagnosis? So the guideline number five tells you that conditions that are integral part of the disease process. So if there's a definitive diagnosis already, <clears throat> And the signs and symptoms that are associated routinely with the disease process should not be assigned as additional code unless otherwise instructed by the classifications. Guys, keep in mind that if that signs and symptoms is already a part of definitive, in our discussion here, there's already a definitive diagnosis. Now, are you allowed to code up? Uh, Uh, signs and symptoms that is integral or part already of the disease it's obviously that if that signs and symptoms is already a part of the disease you no longer need to code your signs and symptoms because remember there's already a definitive diagnosis common example here like for example the ca- the patient came in with cough and difficulty of breathing and the final diagnosis is the patient has asthma So remember that if you have asthma, it is common that you may suffer cough and your difficulty of breathing. So do I need to code the difficulty of breathing or cough? No need to code for them because there's already your definitive diagnosis with your which is your asthma. So you only need to code the asthma condition because those signs and symptoms like difficulty of breathing and your cough is already integral part of your disease process be, guys be careful with this they love to ask questions like this that they keep on saying signs and symptoms in the beginning of the question and at the end of the question or at the end of the scenario they will tell you the final diagnosis so don't just go ahead and read the first line read the question entirely because they love to do this in the actual exam now how should i know what if I don't have any background of that disease. How should I know that these are signs and symptoms of that conditions? Guys, you can always refer to the first page of the chapter specific guideline or to the first page of your tabular list. Like for example, when it starts with J, before the code J, there's a two pages or one page there that will discuss about the anatomy and the conditions and the common signs and symptoms. It's available in your book, guys. So just keep reading. Have an additional idea of all common diseases that they may have in the in the in 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 the book. Common conditions. It's it's Um, a prerogative for you guys to always read signs and symptoms because sometimes they will ask like questions out of the box and it's maybe questions that you don't know so it's still helpful to read and explore and ask for additional information next conditions that are not integral part of a disease process if it, it's not integral To the disease process, meaning it's not part of the disease process, you are uh, allowed to code signs and symptoms. So additional signs and symptoms that may not be associated routinely with the disease process should be coded when present. Like for example, the common example is like for example, the patient came in with um fracture of the uh, tibula or, or or below the legs okay or the legs okay fracture of the the, the fibula like that or can okay, i say fracture of the hands okay the patient came in um due to the fracture of the hands and the patients also suffered um rashes okay um is that rashes related to that fracture okay if you found out that signs and symptoms is not a part of the disease process you are allowed to code it separately so your question is is that signs and symptoms part of the disease process or part of the definitive diagnosis that is already available if your answer is no meaning that signs and symptoms is you may code it separately when present okay sometimes the documentation will tell you that Also, the patient is also suffering. Sometimes provider may document like it's not related. 
Okay, but most of the time, they won't tell you because they are assuming that you only already know the disease process. Okay, next number seven, multiple coding for a single condition. Sometimes, like even if you only have single conditions, you may have an two di two codes. You may have three codes, or you may even have four codes. I have one condition that I know that you only you need to code four codes in just one condition. The common reason why you need to have a multiple codes for a single condition it's sometimes it's because of this guideline, your etiology and manifestations. Remember that when you are coding a certain disease, and if there's an underlying etiology there. Be, that's why you suffer that kind of disease or that sign that condition. The the IC the ICD-10 CM books will always tell you to code first that etiology. Sometimes even you have a conditions like um, you have a condition and there's always a manifestation of that condition. Sometimes the the ICD-10 CM books will always tell you to also code that manifestation. So sometimes it's two codes. The common example here is that requires like for example you suffered your um you suffered um diabetes due to pancreatic cancer so the common reason why you suffered diabetes is because you have your pancreatic cancer remember your pancreas uh, is the one releasing insulin what is very important in order to absorb glucose now if your pancreas is no longer functioning you no longer have any insulin being released so you may end up having your diabetes so that's the common conditions like you can oh you can code two codes or three codes or even four codes even if you have your single condition so use additional code notes are for are found in the tabular list or you may also find this guideline like code first or use additional code for that condition. So the sequencing rule is the same as the theology manifestation pair. You may use an additional code in the case secondary code should be added. But if the instructional note says code first, code first that code that she or the doc, that the ICD 10 CM code is referring to. Okay? Next, acute and chronic conditions. If the same condition is described as both acute and subacute or chronic, what if if a separate sub entries exist in the alphabetic index at the same identification level, code both and sequence the acute first. Keep in mind, this is a common mistake of all students. Like if they found out there's an acute and chronic, sometimes they code first the chronic conditions. Why? Because they usually uh, assume that the chronic conditions should be sequenced first because that is the uh, highest level, you know, that's the um, um, the, the, the intensity of that condition is higher than the acute so they may end up using the coding the chronic first. But remember guys, in your guideline, if both acute or and chronic is available and there's a separate sub entries when we say separate sub entries there's a separate code for acute like for example you have acute tonsillitis and you also have a separate entry for chronic tonsillitis you may code them separately and you need to code first the acute before coding the um, chronic keep in mind that it's very very clear in the guideline that if there's a separate sub entries because sometimes there are conditions like acute and chronic and they are already coded in just one code already like for example you may have a code for acute and chronic respiratory failure there's an available code for single code for that so if there's an available sub entry for both acute and chronic code that only single code use that single code but if there's a separate sub entries for the acute and for the chronic you always need to code them both sequence the acute first the common tip that i usually tell them is acute versus chronic a comes first before letter C. So code acute first and then followed by your chronic conditions. Now let's go to your combination code. A combination code is a single code used to classify. Like 
they are they have available two diagnoses a combination code it's a single code to classify two diagnoses what do you mean by this there are two diagnoses that is available but there they have this combination code they only have one code for those two diagnoses because remember there are certain conditions like they can be happen together most of the time so if they have available code for those two diagnoses if there's a combination code available for the two diagnoses already you may use those combination code next a diagnosis with an associated secondary process like for example if the diagnosis and there's also a secondary process or a manifestation that is always related to that diagnosis you can use them together or you can use that combination code as long as the combination code is available in your selection. A diagnosis with acute complications. Sometimes a, condi a condition or a diagnosis may have always an associated complications. So the ICD TLCM books also already created a single code or a combination code for that. So to at the bottom line is you cannot code separately a certain two diagnoses. You cannot code separately a diagnosis with a manifestation if it's related. You cannot code separately a diagnosis when associated complication is available if there's an available combination code already. Guys, keep in mind that a combination code should be the priority as long as it meets the whole definition of that conditions meaning assign only the combination code when that code fully identifies the diagnostic conditions involved or when the alphabetic index so directs that like you cannot just um i mean I can use this because it's just partly identify all, all those diagnoses. You need to make sure that all diagnoses has been fully identified. Because if that co combination code did not fully identify all the diagnoses available, you cannot code the, the combination codes. You may end up using them coding them separately. Multiple, multiple coding should not be used when the classification provides a combination code. I, I mentioned this a while ago that if there is a combination code available for those two diagnoses, you need to use the combination code because the combination code should be the priority. But keep in mind that before using the combination code, it should fully identify the diagnostic conditions of the patient. But the combination code lacks necessary specificity in describing the manifestation or complication. An additional code should be used as a secondar secondary code. Okay? So if that combination code did not fully um, identify all the diagnoses, you may add up a secondary code just to make sure that you are completely coding the diagnosis or the condition of the patient next we have sequela a sequela is a residual effect meaning this is the long-term effect of a certain conditions or a condition produced after an acute phase of an illness there's no time limit when a sequela code you can be used <clears throat> The residual may be apparent such as like, for example, you may suffer um, <clears throat> cerebral infarction. So the common example, like for example, you have your eye deviations or such, uh, cerebral infarction, or it may occur months or years later such as due to previous injury. The common example of your sequela is like you have a scar. <clears throat> forming resulting from a burn it may you may the acute phase of this condition is the burn now after the acute phase after the burn you may suffer scar or you may have deviated septum due to a nasal fracture so the, those are the residual or the sequela effect of an acute condition or acute phase of an illness Coding of sequelagic requires two codes sequence in the following order. Keep in mind that this is a common question. This is the common um, question in the actual exam. The conditions or nature of the sequela is sequenced first. The sequela code is sequenced second. 
Okay, so you always need to code what is the condition produced first. Like for example, if there's a scar, you need to code the scar first. If there's a deviated septum, you need to code the deviated septum first before coding your sequela code. Your sequela code sometimes it starts with letter S, sometimes it's T depending on the code available in your ICD-10 CM book. Impending or threatened conditions, when we say impending or threatened, it doesn't happen. But there are certain cases that it may happen. So, guys, the guideline is code any condition described at the time of discharge as impending or threatened as follows. Sometimes the doctor will document impending abort, impending myocardial infarction, threatened abortion. Those are common examples. Now, <clears throat> what if that conditions happen? So, the guidelines is... If it did occur, if it happens, obviously, if it, that condition already happened, like if it's impending myocardial infarction and the myocardial infarction already happened, code as it's already confirmed because obviously it's already confirmed. Diagnosis. If it did not occur, <clears throat> if it did not occur, reference the alphabetic index to determine if the condition has a sub-entry for impending. So if the condition did not occur, like for example, impending diabetes, impending myocardial infarction, impending cerebral infarction, so you go ahead to your alphabetic index, go to your letter I, go to your impending, and right below your impending, if there's available myocardial infarction, then cerebral infarction in your sub-entry or to your indentions, you need to use those code available right beside those impending terms or threatened. If there's a listed conditions there right below the term impending, like when you go to the subterm of your impending, if there's available myocardial infarction, cerebral infarction, or diabetes mellitus, you can use that impending word, impending codes. But if the subterms are listed assigned to the given code you need you need to code those but if the subterms are not listed code the existing underlying conditions and not the condition described in the impending or threatened <clears throat> so this is the common co common mistakes like when the subterm is are not available and it's not yet happened, it did not occur yet, your option is to use the signs and symptoms or the conditions being described in the scenario and not that impending one because it did not happen and there's no available subterm in your alphabetic index. Okay? Reporting same diagnosis code more than once. Sometimes, guys, remember there's a um, um there's a bilateral part of your body like you have two kidneys, you have two eyes, two ears like that. So they may suffer the same condition at the same time. So this applies to bilateral conditions. Like your guidelines first code may be reported only once of of an encounter. This applies to bilateral condition when there are no distinct codes identifying laterality. So if there's no distinct codes identifying the laterality or two different conditions classified in the ICD-10 CM diagnosis code, you need to code only once. So uh, no um the guideline is Reporting same diagnosis code more than once. You cannot report more than once if those conditions is the same and there's no distinct codes that may use to identify their laterality or different conditions. So in this example, if the patient has a right kidney infection, the code is N15.9. If the patient may also have left kidney infection, the <clears throat> Code is also N15.9. So you don't need to repeat or code twice. You only need to code once the N15.9. Okay? Next, we have the laterality. The laterality meaning is it left, right, or bilateral. This is a common to your body parts that is bilateral or there's a two parts. So some ICD and CM codes indicate laterality, specifying whether the conditions occurs on a left right or is is bilateral <clears throat> if no bilateral code is provided and the condition is bilateral assign separate codes for both left and right if the side not identified on the medical record 
sign the code for the unspecified code side guys keep in mind that this is a common mistake like if you have this code available for the left and the right code for the left and the right but if there's an available bilateral code you need to use that bilateral code first that's the priority but what if there's a condition that it happens to the right and the left but there's no available bilateral code in the book so you need to code the left and the right so you always need to verify you always need to check if there's a bilateral code available in your icd 10 cm book and it happens to your light right and left use that bilateral if a condition happens to the right and left and there's no bilateral code available in your icd 10 cm book you need to code the right and the left so you're now you have no options but if there's no side specified in the scenario you may end up using your unspecified side okay documentation by clinicians other than patients provider we may say clinicians these are the common um team in your in the office like your nurse practitioners you may have your nurse you may have your ma's like that or dietitians like that so code assignments based on documentation by patients provider usually the patient provider should be the one to document but the few exemptions, such as for the BMI, your chronic ulcer stage, your coma scales, can be documented by the other clinicians and not the providers. And is typically by, uh, documented by other clinicians involving the care of the patients. Okay, so you can code. It's it's um. It is allowed to code those conditions because normally it is a, it is common that those documentation is usually done by other clinicians. Okay, so that's fine. Okay, syndromes follow the alphabetic index guideline when coding syndromes. In the absence of your alphabetic index guideline, assign codes to documented manifestation of the syndrome. If, like for example, Down syndrome, if there's a sin, go to your alphabetic index, go to your syndrome, and go to you th sub entry down. If there's no available code for the syndrome, you just need to code the manifestation that is indicated. Additional codes for manifestations that are not integral part of the disease process may also be assigned when the condition does not have a unique code. Documentation of complication of care. Like, this is very important, guys, when coding your complication of care. Code assignment is based on provider's document. We cannot just assume that that complication is due to the procedure done. Okay, the code assignment is always based on the provider's documentation of the relationship between the condition and the complication and care or procedure unless otherwise instructed by the classification. The guideline extends to any complication of care regardless of the chapter code is located in. It is important to note that not all conditions that occur during or following a medical care or surgery are classified as complication. This is the reminder because not all conditions occur right after a medical care or surgery is already a complication. There must be a cause and an effect relationship between that procedure or surgery being done by the provider versus the complication we cannot assume guys to so the documentation should always identify should they should always specify in the documentation that that is the complication of the care that they perform query the provider for clarification if complication is not clearly documented because as per your guideline they need to document it clearly they need to specify the cause and effect of a relationship of that complications of care borderline diagnosis is quite the same with impending and your threatened if the provider document provider documents a borderline diagnosis at the time of discharge the diagnosis is coded as confirmed unless the classification provides a specific entry for borderline like for example borderline diabetes 
when you go to your alphabetic index, go ahead to your borderline. If you can see a sub entry of diabetes there, you need to use that code available there in your alphabetic index and verify in your tabular list. If there's an available code for borderline, if there's no borderline code available, you need to code it as it's already confirmed. Unlike with threatened and impending, there are additional guidelines if it occur or if it did not occur. In your borderline, you can automatically assume that it's already confirmed unless a specific entry is available. Like this one, if there's available borderline entry for diabetes, you need to code that borderline code for diabetes first. Okay? If a borderline code contains a specific entry in the ICD 10 CM, it should not be coded such thing. Since borderline conditions are not uncertain diagnosis, no distinction is between care setting, inpatient versus outpatient. Whenever the documentation is unclear regarding a borderline condition, coders are encouraged to query for clarifications. Okay. The use of signs and symptoms versus unspecified are acceptable if there's no um available there's no definitive diagnosis yet we've been discussing this one a while ago you are allowed to code the signs and symptoms if there's no if there's no specific um there's no specific or definitive diagnosis yet you are also allowed to code for unspecified if there's no sufficient medic medic documentation in the medical record well specific diagnosis code should be reported when they are supported by available medical record documentation and clinical knowledge of the patient's health conditions there are instances when signs and symptoms or unspecified codes are the best choices for accurately accurately reflecting the healthcare encounter each healthcare encounter should be coded to the level of certainty known for that encounter. Because remember, you cannot assume if, like, they document pneumonia and there's no other documentation what type of pneumonia is that, you end up using unspecified unless you can query your provider right away, which is not usually the, the case because it takes time to query sometimes the physicians, okay? Coding for healthcare encounters in hurricane aftermath. So these guidelines is just new additional guidelines. And this is just focusing on the hurricane aftermath. So it happens in the US, the hurricane. So um the hurricane um in the acid and NCM codes, these are coded under your um external code cost codes rather external cost codes so this uh, guideline use of external cause of morbidity morbidity codes these are used an external cause of morbidity codes should be assigned to identify the cause of injuries like for example you suffered fracture due to the hurricane you suffered um contusion concussions due to your uh hurricane the use of external cause code morbidity is supplemental to add to, to the application of icd-10 cm codes Okay, so you need to code that external cause due to, I mean, the the injury due to a hurricane. So you have an available code for that, external cause code. But you always need to code the condition happened first before coding your external cause code for your morbidity. Sequencing of external cause codes for the hurricane aftermath. When we will discuss the external cause codes in your chapter 20, actually chapter 20, we will have this leveling or this um, hierarchy of your external cost codes. Code for cataclysmic events such as hurricane take priority over all the external cost codes except the child and abuse and terrorism. Remember guys, when we discuss chapter 20, the first thing that you need to code as external cost code if there's an abuse, a child and adult abuse followed by terrorism and next one is your aftermath of your hurricane so that is the the hierarchy when coding external cost codes i will further discuss this guys when we go through your chapter 20 in your chapter specific guidelines there are other external cause of morbidity code issues for injuries that are not direct result of hurricane, such as evacuee that is incurred, uh, evacuee that has incurred an injury as a result of motor vehicle accident. Assign that other external cause code, not that uh, external cause code due to hurricane because that is not by direct 
result of a hurricane. Guys, the reminder here is you can only code the external cost code for hurricane aftermath as long as that condition or that injury is just really related to that hurricane aftermath conditions. Okay? The use of Z codes. Z codes is other reason for healthcare, healthcare encounters may be assigned as appropriate to further explain the reason for, for presenting or for healthcare services, including transfers between healthcare facilities like homelessness, inadequate housing, and extremity poverty. There are conditions like there are common reason of there are common cases that the patient came into the clinic or to the office that without any conditions, just like the patient proceeds uh, presents for um you, it is very uh it is a mandatory to, to use for your reason for visit sometimes there's no condition available yet you may end up using your z codes just to specify the reason for visit of the patients okay so that is your general coding guidelines up next we will now start coding or we will just now start discussing the chapter specific coding guidelines so stay tuned guys and again if you're new to my channel don't forget to hit the subscribe button hit the notification bell you may see the description below you may see the other videos like in your cpc tips and tricks you may also videos see videos there on how to become a home base medical coder and biller you also see there a link below wherein you can see your uh, ICD-10 made easy. Please click that link. Purchase that um, ICD-10 made easy because that's very helpful, guys, for you. Okay? Thank you and stay tuned for our chapter-specific coding guidelines discussion. Have a good day.